ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host, Kerrigan. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Welcome, welcome to Witch Talk. My name is Kerrigan, and here we are again with a wonderful, wonderful show to share with you. This time, we're going to talk about alchemy, which is, for some, a mystery. For others, uh, not so, but still, we want to bring uh, light to this absolutely amazing discipline. Um, and with us, we have um, um, expert on it. But before we go there, obviously, I wanted to show you uh, some sites that we put up for you. One of them is the first, for the first time, we have uh, another um, Witch Talk show uh, website. Uh, the link is the same. So the, the, um, the actually, the, the address is the same. So www.witchtalk.witchtalkshow.com. It's the same thing, but you do have... Um, all of the links here. Uh, don't forget that to, to go if you want to get this on just uh, audio, which is as a podcast, we also have that on Witch Talk. Um, this is a video cast, but you can actually only get the sound out of it. Um, and you just go to our website, www.witchtalkshow.com, and you can actually, uh, there's a link there which which is sa says radio podcast, and then you just click on iTunes. Um, and it's a drop down menu, so, you know, and you can subscribe through iTunes. If you want just to, um, get download the mp3 file you can just grab them by um, you know clicking on that link and then go here so you can just grab them here it's very very easy um, so that's that and uh, you can get the witch reads in here you can get the Facebook page also the Twitter the apparel, uh, 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 the apparel uh, and all of that so all of the good things that you can get on the other side you can get on this one so it's it's absolutely the same thing um, and you can contact us through here so uh, if you want to contact us you have a little form here that you can use to do so don't forget that we have a Facebook page also uh, at your disposal so that you can actually um, if you like us on in here you can actually get everything which talk um, and be um, uh, you, know, you know on top of every episode and what's happening in in the next week also on our Facebook page you have the Ustream live link which is very very good because you can actually watch our show directly from Facebook so just click on Ustream live and it'll be all set. Don't forget also our uh, sponsor is Logios and they have a wonderful website right now. Um, it's a flash website. They have all these things. It's www.logios.biz. Um, they have a store. Um, it's a beautiful store with beautiful items. Uh, you can also contact them. Um, they are actually uh, the ones who provide us with all this, you know, and the, the, all this production. Indigo Estrella is the one who actually does the production but Redbird is the one uh, who provides that to us through Logio so it's a wonderful thing and they do CDs and DVDs and all of that so it's production by Redbird which is a brand of Logio's publishing um, and uh, they have if you have um, you know uh, um, books or things that you wanted to publish also you can contact them with uh, you know your um, work and and they will look at it and see if it fits on the Logios publishing um, company and it's absolutely amazing they do also websites which is amazing and um, they did this uh, website they did my website they did uh, Jamal's Diffusos website so it's absolutely amazing it's all in flash and it's very very good um, and uh, that's it I guess uh, you have a lot of examples here of things uh, on Logios so that's basically what I had to say about Logios. Let me just show you now with a little bit more specific on sound uh, how how you can contact us. Here we go. So you want to know how to keep in touch with everything Witch Talk. Go to www.witchtalkshow.com and follow all the latest news. Listen directly to the show and enjoy it. 
If you're on the move, take Witch Talk with you by subscribing to our Witch Talk podcast on iTunes or by following us on Buzzsprout Witch Talk site by going to witchtalkbuzzsprout.com. Don't forget to join us on Ustream Crowd. Go to www.ustream.tv slash channel slash witchtalk dash show. Miss the show? Don't worry. Every show will be recorded and available for you to watch or listen both in Ustream and Buzzsprout. Witch Talk will air every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or approximately 9 p.m. in most Europe. Now live in video, watch us on Ustream. Follow us on Twitter at Carrigan, K-H-A-R-A-G-A-N with an H after the K. Or send us an email at witchtalkshow at gmail.com. Now back to the show. And here we are, back to the show again, uh, and today we're going to talk about alchemy, which is a very intriguing subject and discipline. Um, and uh, with with us, we have an expert also on this, and we'll announce it a little bit later. For now, we have to talk with Indigo Estrella, because she's um, actually going to talk about a tarot deck that it's very, very interesting. Let's just see. <laughs> Witches talk about which books witches read. With Indigo Estrella, which reads. Hello, Indigo. <laughs> Hello, Carrigan. I, every time, every time <gasps> I I've heard I hear this this thing. We have to change this because this is not books only. You know, <laughs> kind of a, yeah. You know, which well, read? I mean, technically, you can read the tarot cards. That's true. That's There's true. a different kind of you know definition for the word read. <laughs> I know. But yeah, you but know, which books which reads? I mean, really? Uh, yeah. You know, well. we have to we have to <laughs> change that. But you know, we will eventually. So <laughs> today we're talking about uh, something that it's very very interesting. It's a tarot yeah. deck. It's a very special tarot deck, right? Right? So it tell is, us about it. Is. It. Well, it's called the Wizard's Tarot, and it's loosely based off of the Harry Potter um, Hogwarts. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm not sure, but you know, it, that's it's very, very similar. You know, you, you're welcome to Mandrake Academy, and the Major Arcana are different professors. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, it's. You know, it's it's very similar to you know the Harry Potter world, but it's far enough away from you know the the fantasy world that J.K. Rowling made mm -hmm. to not have copyright infringement. Yes. So, <laughs> <laughs> so basically, the Wizard's Tarot is what happens when you mix Harry Potter and Rider Waite Smith tarot deck together. Oh wow, wow. Um, and it's a CG deck, so it's it's digitally made. Yeah. Um, it's it's very beautiful. It's uh, the artwork. We're, we're we're doing we're doing right now. I mean, for people that are just listening to us, you know, you have to go and see it. There is actually um, a video that you can uh, watch. It's called the Wizard's Tarot Preview. So if you type that on YouTube, you can actually go later on and see it. For those of you who are actually seeing this video cast, you can actually enjoy it because we're watching it right now. <laughs> <laughs> it's very beautiful. I yes. mean, there's there's um, a lot of artists, it seems, recently that are starting to use digital medium as a part of their um, their tarot art, and I, I love it. You know, especially the high quality like this, uh, I I think it's fantastic. You know, to to branch out and go on for more than just um, traditional artwork. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's it's. Very beautiful. The the imagery and the mythos of this deck, it's very, you know, it's mystical. Mm -hmm. um, and the witchcraft and wizardry is the focus. So, I mean, it's set in, like I said, it's the world of Mandrake Academy. And it's kind of, in the book it says that you're a magical student and you're learning the ways of magic. So, you know, each of the major arcana cards is your new professor and they teach you their own, um, their own craft. You know, like the, the magician is the professor of basic magic and it's it's very interesting so it's very similar 
almost identical many of the times to Rider Waite Tarot. Yes. But in the Major Arcana, I see the most creative um, differences. Mm -hmm. For example, there's a name change in four of the cards. So the Devil is now the Dark Lord. Um, the Fool is now the Initiate. And, you know, the Fool isn't jumping off the edge of a cliff like we see in traditional Rider Waite Smith Tarot decks. Yes. The Fool is kind of, you know, she's got a little rabbit and she's she's embarking on her journey into the school and it's interesting it's got a different different meaning than the traditional fool and this is very important because you know sometimes people refer to or or connect a little bit better to that particular imagery mm -hmm. you know that do not connect with the right of weight or yeah. you know or any other you know and it's very very it's beautiful and it's very well done I mean I would love to have the person who actually did this um, on the show because it's absolutely amazing and I'm very curious about the way she actually um, you know, came up with this uh, mm -hmm. image. Yeah, I mean, and, that was, yeah. you know, it's very interesting. <laughs> very interesting. Now, um, how many, how many, um, how many uh, caldrons do we have here? Well, three and a half. Okay. But let me say why. Okay. Uh, it's very beautiful. The card stock themselves, it's very flimsy. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I wouldn't say that it's very cheap, but I know it's, it's actually, not going to hold up well. <laughs> let me just say <laughs> one thing. It's John Blomman. Uh, it's the the artwork, so it's not really a she, but the design is by Carrie, which that's by Corinne, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why I, you know, kind of like said she, <laughs> but it's not well, she. Sorry, no. They work together, Corinne. Yes, Corinne and, and John. John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I mixed yeah. them up. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I, but I would love to have them too. You know, uh, the mm -hmm. two of them um, to talk about this. But you were saying, you know, why? Why it's three? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, I love the artwork, yeah. um, but the cards themselves, like I said before, uh, I need to have a stronger deck mm -hmm. to hold up to my kind of abuse of the cards. Mm -hmm. I like to shuffle and I like to have a good firm, you know, give on the cards. I don't want to have to feel like it's going to go flying everywhere. Yes. And, you know? and, and the cards, uh, describe the cards to us. So they're small, is that it? They're, no, they're standard size. Okay. So you know they're, they're you know the regular, regular Terror, width and height, sure, yeah. but it's it's just, just kind of flimsy. They're they're similar to the feel of the Robin Wood tarot, which I didn't really like mm -hmm, either. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so maybe it's just certain decks. But what is don't it? Get. What is it? Is the thickness of the card? Is that? Yeah, it? it's the thickness. It's very thin. Okay. Um, and and I don't want to. I don't want to bend my tarot cards. I, I, I don't want it to be too, it's, I don't know. It's not, it's not firm enough. I like to have a firm deck to, you know, after a few years, it's not going to hold up. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I also really don't like the borders <laughs> of the tarot deck. Um, oh, okay. The, the outside, it's kind of like blue with different um, gold filigree almost mm -hmm. around the outside. Mm -hmm. And I just don't see why that was necessary. You know, it, the world needs more borderless tarot, in my opinion. And <laughs> this would be perfect. I know, you know, it's, I know, yeah. <laughs> it's very distracting. Yes, you know, where, yeah, yeah. you know, I, I can see where they wanted it to have the tarot just pop out of the deck and just like you really see the image. But when it's blue with all this, you know, it's kind of like um, it's got different shades of blue too. It's kind of like well, blue that, and then you know, grayish blue that, and then the gold and it's. But that's that's what happens also, and I do believe that it's the same kind of thing with the magic mirrors, uh, the black mirrors as they call them. Um, it, because and some people have like these beautiful things around the black mirror. It's just this very intricate work of gold and silver and crescents and <laughs> pentagrams and blah blah. And then uh, you know it's distracting. Uh, yes. You know a black mirror is a black mirror. It's not you know it, there's no frame, no frame at all. So I think that the tarot works the same way. I think yeah. that you know the image in the tarot has to actually talk by itself. Right. You don't need anything else than that. Yeah. And you know the images are so beautiful. I would have loved to just have the edges just expanded out to the corners mm -hmm. of the cards without the border to really you know you can get into more detail mm -hmm. if it's bigger and you know, it's it's just it's distracting so mm -hmm. i think i might go the way that donnelly 
has been going recently, our friend Donna Leda LaRose. Yes. And she's been trimming off the edges of her tarot decks. And I think this is the first deck that I've actually really strongly considering doing. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. She's, she's um, doing that, yeah. Yeah, and it's beautiful. I know. I the know. other things I didn't like about the tarot deck, um, well, the minor arcana, it's very, very, very similar to Rider Waite tarot. Okay. I would say... It is a Rider Waite tarot with the exception of maybe one or two cards. Yeah. Um, and the way that the artist envisioned this part of the tarot, the Minor Arcana, is that it's the fellow students. So each of the four suits represents the four schools of magic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's fire, which are the wands, and water magic, which is the cups, air, swords, and earth magic is the pentacles. Uh, so it's more the traditional um, elemental correspondences. Mm -hmm. And the court cards are now renamed as the royal families, and each royal family depicts elemental creatures associated with the suit. Mm -hmm. So you've got salamanders, gnomes, sylphs, and undines. Mm -hmm. um, I really didn't like the gnomes, and let me tell you why. <laughs> I know there's a lot of people who have said that they didn't like how stoic they looked, but, you know, when I think of gnomes tend to think of them being very stoic. Yeah. The problem for me is the depth of field. I, when I first saw them, I thought they might be giants because they take up so much of the space mm -hmm. and there's nothing to really give you the perception of that these are known. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So that's my one complaint about that. Another thing is that in the book, the artist mentioned that um, the Earth, magic, you know, students of magic of Earth, mm -hmm. the pentacles, or, and I quote, the least studious group of students at the School of Magic and Mystery. Instead of list, re reading books or listening to lectures, they prefer to learn by doing. Now, I know you're an earth sign, and I'm not going to say that you're not very studious, but <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a gross, uh, just, it's, it's not wrong, it's not right. Yeah. Um, the most studious people I know are Virgos. Yeah. And they're an earth sign. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. So I yeah. don't know if that was just maybe just an oversight. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I don't I don't agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the salamanders of the royal family of wands, they look like they belong in Avatar. Oh, really? They do. It's very interesting. They're kind of, they're like blue-greenish. Oh, and they've got these oh. weird, like, spikes coming out of their head. It's very interesting. Oh, wow. Um. Well, the, so, uh, the artwork is absolutely wonderful. Do you know? Is. Do you know if it works? I mean, does it work for you? Um, did you try it and see if it really works? It does, and you know, there's yeah. some really interesting uh, tarot spreads that are within the book themselves. There's um, there's separate spreads for the major arcana. Mm -hmm. Like for example, there is um, the death card or transfiguration as it says in this book there's a detailed 11 card past life spread oh I which like is very that. interesting like um that. the sun card includes a chart of the sabbats mm -hmm. their dates and their sun sign and degree along with their significance mm -hmm. so in, in the sun card you can see that the um the professor of solar magic it has a he has a um wheel of the year that he's got with him so it's very interesting oh, wow. and it does it does work yeah, you know yeah yeah so it's very beautiful. Well, as I said before, you know, you can just, you can even divine with, um, you know, corn. So it's kind of like... <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> you know, I prefer using a beautiful deck like this yes. to corn. Um, <laughs> unless, I would, unless I were feeding chickens, then I would throw, you know, I would... Well, but that's that's one of the one of the ways of divining with corn is uh, to throw it with uh, uh, to chickens and then see which right. ones they pick yeah, and where. So that's very interesting. Yeah. So okay. So uh, three and a half. Is that it? Yes, that's good. Almost very good. So oh. I, I recommend it, especially if you're a fan of uh, you know digital artwork. If you're a fan of the Harry Potter series, you'll yeah, probably like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and you know, just just it would be a fantastic uh, collection if you have a tarot collection. It would be just a fantastic addition to it. And it so. reminds me, uh, Chiro Marchetti's, um style. I mean, it's not yeah. really the same Im imagery, but it's the style is very similar. It's very interesting, and I think that it's because it's digital, right? Yeah, it's um, digital. But you know, with mm. with Chiro's artwork, it's 
it tends to be a little bit more bright and vibrant. Yes. Whereas this deck, it's a little bit more darker, more mysterious. Mm -hmm. It's you know, it's in keeping with uh, that you know that darker, you know, mysterious magic. You know, you look deeper into the mystery. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's. It's very beautiful. Very interesting. Very interesting. I just, I just love it. I really do. And I'm very interested in that um, live, um, previous live. What, it, what is it? A spread. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a eleven card past 11 life card spread. Eleven past life. Okay. That's very mm -hmm. interesting. Okay. And that's interesting that it works with the transfiguration or death card. Oh wow, that's Isn't very it? interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Wow. I wonder if we can just apply that to any other, you know. Uh, deck. That would be interesting. Yeah. I'll give that a try. Yeah, yeah. So thank <laughs> you so much, Indigo, for this fantastic review on this uh, tarot <laughs> deck, the Wizard's Tarot, right? And, yes. Um, it's you can find it on the Wizard's Tarot's um, the Wizards. What is it? Uh, I don't remember. It's wizardstarot.com. Yes, wizardstarot.com, and um, so you can just actually get there and and see if you can you know see a little bit more, and perhaps you just fall in love with it. You know, sometimes it <laughs> <Yeah>. happens. <laughs> you, know? you can see all of the cards in the deck. You can see the majors and all the minor arcana. Yes. So you know it's. It's very beautiful. It's very, very good. So, Highly recommend it. Thank you so much <laughs> for this wonderful review. And uh, you will be on the chat room, I presume. I will be. Yes, I will. And very but, excited for today's show. I know. Me too. Uh, and But there is a thing that you're not going to be here next show. I will not. Mm. It's Father's Day here in America. Yes. So I have family obligations. Yes, yes. But I will return afterwards. Yes, yes. But it's good, though, because it will give you more time to talk with... Um, it's Raymond Brooklyn. Raymond yeah, Raymond Buckland. Yes. So yes. Buckland, yeah. it might be a good thing that I'm not on the show next week to, to blabber on and on. Yes. We can hear from uh, more from our guests. Yes, it will be <laughs> it will be wonderful a wonderful show. And I'm you know uh, it's it's a pity, but you can actually hear it afterwards. Um, I will yeah. actually. Yeah, so I definitely it's very, will. very good. Well, thank you again um, for this wonderful review of the Wizard's Tarot, and uh, I will see you not next week, but the week next to that. Sounds great. Okay. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 And that was Indigo Estrella with uh, the Wizard's Tarot Review. Uh, three and a half quadrants. Oh, well. <laughs> it's, you know, sometimes, and, and the reasons are absolutely amazing uh, for what, you know, I, I really do agree that we need thicker cards and no borders, people. So if you're, if you're an artist and you're publishing your tarot deck, please do not put distracting borders on it. So the imagery of the tarot is sufficient to get us going. So this is the voice of the practitioners and Donna Lay is trimming them. So don't, don't let her do that and just forget about the borders. So we're going to go now with um, the introduction for our guest today. We're going to listen to the introduction and see who he is. And then we will begin to talk with him. So here we go, uh, our guest for today. Robert Allen Bartlett is a practicing alchemist and author. He began his alchemical study at the Paracelsus Research Society, later Paracelsus College, under the guidance of one of the 20th century most highly recognized alchemists, Dr. Albert Rendell, Frater Albertus. In 79, he received his Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry and immediately began working at the Paralab as chief chemist. He was selected by Frater Albertus to become a director of research at Three Star, the future vision of Frater Albertus which would combine the Paracelsus College, Paralab and Healing Arts Center into one complex. Unfortunately, with the death of Frater Albertus in 84, both the college and the Paralab closed its doors and Three Star Dream was never realized. Robert's pursuit of alchemical research never diminished as he continued his chemistry career as a research scientist for new ceramic materials, then later as a chemistry department manager for a large material testing laboratory. Robert is currently living in Pacific Northwest with his wife and two daughters, where he has been teaching classes and giving workshops on practical alchemy since 2002. 
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my guest today on Witch Talk, Robert Allen Bartlett. Welcome, welcome, Robert. Welcome, and thank you so much for um, accepting this invitation from Witch Talk to be here with us today. How are you? Great. Thank you for having me. <laughs> oh, it's a pleasure. It's a, an enormous pleasure, believe me. Um, so, uh, you know, the, people have this very wrong perception that alchemy, it's something that was a derage kind of thing that happened in the Middle Ages to some people, and they begin to turn, you know, uh, common metals to into gold, or in search of the philosophical um, stone, and all of that, and the elixir of life, and, and all of these things that seems very, very, very untrue and very uh, strange to some people. And the fact is that they actually dismiss alchemy altogether, because they think that it's just, you know, some delusional uh, of, of some, some of the, you know, people on, on the Middle Ages. I don't know why the Middle Ages, but that's what they think. And um, but but you know and and this is very interesting um, because here you are, an alchemist, <laughs> and um, on on this show telling us a little bit. And you wrote two books. One of them is is called Real Alchemy, and then the other one is The Way of the Crucible, uh, on alchemy, on practical practical alchemy. And you do have actually classes on alchemy. Um, so where is this coming from? Where is the alchemy come from? Well, alchemy is really one of the most ancient esoteric traditions that there is. I mean, the alchemists were originally the, the first natural philosophers, and even from ancient times uh, in, in Egypt, the priesthood were studying... Uh, the Netters, the Neteru, the different gods and goddesses, they were really archetypes of universal forces mm -hmm. and the whole development of man's interaction with those forces uh, really began in those temples and passed on as a secret science, uh, word of mouth under oaths of initiation and uh, secrecy uh, all through time. And uh, by the time uh, that Alexander entered Egypt, um, these secret sciences had developed quite a bit. There were temples of the mysteries, and that's the information that were passed on. Mm -hmm. uh, Alexander brought it into Greece, and uh, they called Egypt Chem, and it, the secret science became known as Chemia. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, these were secret sciences about the forces of nature and how to harness those and really how to operate alongside nature. Mm -hmm. Later on, when the Roman Empire took over Egypt, uh, the alchemists were pretty much exiled or executed. Uh, the Romans were afraid that this Egyptian secret art could uh, fund an army really, to uh, move against Rome <laughs> through the use of, you know, artificially created stones and gold and precious metals. Uh, yes. So they tried to eradicate it, burned books, and destroyed temples, killed teachers. Uh, the alchemists disappeared into Arabian countries, uh, out of reach of Rome, and Arabian alchemists kind of uh, collected a lot of the Greek and Egyptian alchemical texts uh, later, the, around 1100. Mm -hmm. This information moved back into uh, Europe, and people had started to hear about the wonders of alchemy, especially transmutation of metals into gold, which is a side product of alchemy. Alchemy is really about understanding the forces of nature and, mm -hmm. and how they operate and our place within that realm. Now, uh, Frater Albertus um, have this, this definition of, of alchemy that I just love. 
He said that alchemy was the process of consciously assisted evolution. Can you comment on that? Exactly. That's uh, and that gets back to the archetypal forces that the Egyptians were studying and how nature is moving and everything is evolving. And so understanding the laws and principles that nature is operating under, we can consciously assist our own evolution. That's amazing. That's very interesting. Now, we know that, you know, as you said, you know, in Rome, um, you know, alchemy was, you know, depressed. And then um, we see that, you know, alchemy just, you know, disappears and then appears again and then disappears again and then appears again. Um, yeah. Now, uh, you know, through the ages and then, you know, uh, and we have, you know, Popes, you know, uh, ordering uh, the uh, not the, not only the, the you know disappearing all the, all the information of burning books and all of that. You know, they did that for everything, but you know, obviously yeah. for alchemy also. Um, so, where do you think that this very strange mix, mis, misconception, um, because people don't really think that alchemy go back to that far, um, they always place it in the Middle Ages. Why? Why do you think that? Well, it had a heyday at that time. Uh, mm -hmm. Alchemical books started to proliferate, mm -hmm. and everyone tried their hand at making gold. Uh, you know, the West is always going for the gold, and <laughs> so it became a very popular pursuit, and there were a lot of con men and charlatans that tried to rip people off, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and alchemy just got this really bad name as a fraud and a fake and a rip-off yes. scam. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was. it's been pretty much stamped that way, um, and it went underground. Uh, the true principles of alchemy were taught in the mystery schools. Yeah, and they, yeah, yeah. The esoteric orders that developed, like the Rosicrucians and such, carried on the laboratory traditions of alchemy, because these same principles, you know, the archetypes that we talked about in astrology or Kabbalah or the Tarot, they have their material reflections or they're analogs in matter, mm -hmm. the same forces, mm -hmm. and that's what the alchemist is working with, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. understanding those maps like astrology and the Kabbalah and how that force becomes manifest and how it can be uh, manipulated to uh, provoke its evolution. That's very interesting. Not just... Uh, um, for people and for any matter, yeah, you know, take yeah. a plant or a yeah. metal. The the ultimate experiment was to, of course, um, transmute metals, and that would be to evolve a metal of a lower order, say like copper or iron, and evolve it into what it wants to become, gold, mm -hmm. which is an incorruptible body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and gold being the purest, you know, the more, yeah. It, gold is, yeah, gold is incorruptible. You yeah. can bury it in yeah. the ocean for a thousand years and it still comes up shiny <laughs> and warm. <laughs> Take any other metal and it's, it has corrosion. Yes. And those yeah. those principles of corrosion or uh, those are defects in the metals. They're trying to overcome and evolve past that. Mm -hmm. Just like people have their own uh, corrosion products and materials that are hindering their evolution. Yes. yes. So these same principles in in laboratory alchemy can be seen, you know, on the larger scale on the outside. What's happening in the world right now, all these wars and commotion, it's all a calcination process <laughs> in in alchemical terms. Yes. Yeah. It's purification. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. and as you deal with alchemy and the processes and products, um, you can see these same principles, not just uh, on a large scale, uh, but all the way down to the small scale. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. so you're now, dealing with world events or now, crystals on the table. Now, Robert, how did you get here? I mean, how were you brought to alchemy? I mean, was this an interest that you had in, as a child? Was I mean, I've, I've heard um, uh, you have two videos in the internet. One of them is, for, you know, both of them are just amazing, and I really urge people to actually watch them because they're very, very good. Uh, Real Alchemy, you just can type that into um, YouTube and you can get there. Um, 
but there's there's this comment on one of your videos that this guy just wrote there this is very weird and I quote this is very weird I am 12 years old and right now I am interesting in in uh, in alchemy so <laughs> And this was one of the, you know, um, I can say boy, a boy that was actually uh, listening to you and watching your video talking about the uh, Asperger uh, Institute, um, yeah. and and it's it's just amazing. How how old were you when you begin to be interested in this and and begin to think, well, maybe there's something more than just you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that boy was probably me fifty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I always I knew that you were you were answering them that way. <laughs> so twelve years well, my, old. My uh, my dad owned a die casting shop, and so growing up, you know, I was exposed to large furnaces and crucibles and molten metal and and such for an early age. And I later got a passion for rocks and minerals, and started a collection of those when I was maybe five or six and later learned that you could torture and abuse rocks to figure out what their names were, you know, scratching them and burning them and dropping acid on them to figure out what actual rock that was. And I started to look in the libraries uh, for additional information on working with rocks and minerals, and I discovered alchemy because there were a lot of uh, references to alchemists uh, working with mineral substances, and I just got fascinated with the, the artwork and the information and took it from there. I started studying uh, alchemical texts that I could find and then uh, supplementing that with astrology and magical works uh, that I could find. I studied uh, the Golden Dawn material, material by uh, Franz Barden by the time I was in high school. Uh, and <laughs> Later, uh, got a, um, I read a, a reference by Israel Regardian, one of the uh, Llewellyn Times magazines, and uh, he mentioned Frater Albertus's uh, Paracelsus College or the uh, institute there. So I, uh, I applied and uh, started my first class in 1974. And the classes were like two weeks long, over uh, seven years. So each year for seven years there's a two week long very intensive class that runs from nine in the morning till five in the evening and then lab work and homework all night and you're pretty much cloistered there for two weeks with other like-minded people you know just totally immersed in in alchemy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. over a period of seven years mm -hmm. and um, i had already begun a, a the curriculum in, in college to, to get a degree in chemistry, but I, I kind of dropped it out and just devoted full-time work on uh, alchemy. Mm -hmm. But Frater Albertus uh, convinced me to go back and finish my degree, and uh, he wanted me to work at Paralab, which was uh, the commercial offshoot of the college. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so I went in and finished my degree and uh, became the chief chemist at Paralab for several years, worked closely with uh, Rod Albertus developing uh, mineral and metallic uh, products for uh, for research and development in in uh, medical fields mm -hmm. mostly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, and, now, t now, tell me one thing. Uh, uh, you know, you talk about that in 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 your video. There's a lot of obviously benefits. Um, uh, of the alchemical uh, products, um, or, or you know that the you know the operations and procedures that develop al alchemical medicines, um, and but it's not yet. I mean, they are looking at it, um, but it's not yet recognized by the medical professions. Um, yeah. uh, did you find uh, fellow chemists, uh, and I'm talking about not related to, but fellow chemists? Um, that that you know know that you're you're an alchemist and you do this you know all of these uh, operations and procedures to develop alchemical medicines. What do they say to you when you explain to them? You know you can do this and you can do that and then 
and they, they're still they, stuck in the Middle Ages. They give me a sidelong look and say, "Oh yeah, transmuting gold." Huh? <laughs> it, we always go to the gold, isn't it? It's just that yeah. stigma <laughs> that is hanging yeah. on your head that nobody gets rid of still today. <laughs> <laughs> the glitter of gold. I know, I know. We have we have a question <laughs> from the chat room um, from Master Nestor. He's a ceremonial magician. He's asking you: Have you ever tried to make a homunculus? Homo oh, oh, homunculus. Yes. <laughs> um, yes and no. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, I've done experiments in that realm and in that uh, along that line, but never gone for an actual homunculus. There was a a work recently by uh, Joe Leshevsky um, entitled uh, "Israel Regardi and the Philosopher's Stone." You can find it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, he talks about his experience in, in trying to create a homunculus. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting work. I've I worked along similar lines with basically water, using rainwater as an alchemical material, starting material. Mm -hmm. There are amazing things in water, water alone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. yeah, yeah. No, that's very interesting. Another question from uh, from the chat room. Can 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 you talk about Ormus, also uh, known as uh, monoatomic gold? Yes, I. Uh, I'm not personally involved. I'm, I've done some work with the Ormus materials, mm -hmm. um, but I'm following more the traditional lines, mm -hmm. and, and those are somewhat, they're interesting to me, but not a focus of my uh, research. And I am watching developments in that area. They do follow what I think uh, more along the lines of the uh, Indian alchemical system, mm -hmm. uh, Ayurvedic system, mm -hmm. where they reduce materials to a very uh, uh, monoatomic or uh, very fine particle size, mm -hmm. metals in general. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, um, Indigo is asking actually uh, that, that she heard that, that there's a lot of benefits from taking Hormus as a daily supplement. Um, and, and do you know that if this is true, if that's, that's a benefit or not? Well, I've heard good and bad. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard people who uh, who swear by it and say they take some every day, and and I know people who are uh, possibly not here any longer <laughs> because of taking it. <laughs> much of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty so radical. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's maybe a dose-related issue or an yeah. individual issue. People can take more or less, um, but I think there's still a lot of investigation that needs to go in uh, before you. You know, start doling it out and absolutely, the, uh, absolutely. Health food store. Yeah, yeah. Now, now we have the la the last question from from until uh, today, until uh, now, um, uh, from the chat room. Um, uh, he, he, it's Master Nestor. He wants to know if you met Joseph Lizinski when you studied with Albertus. Lizinski. Lizinski. No, we sorry, uh, <laughs> Lizinski. Actually, we were in the classes at the same time, mm -hmm. but. Uh, they were like a spring and a fall session. I think we were kind of staggered. I never met him personally, although he may have come through the lab on a tour because Roger Albertus always brought all the classes through on mm -hmm, tours. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I may have met him in passing, but no, I don't know him personally. Now, you continued um, the work of Roger Albertus, and actually you have something that it's called the Spurge. Uh, sp um, I, I have a, a lot of trouble with this word. Spargericus Institute, right? <laughs> okay, I got it wrong. Um, uh, and you hold classes, and um, you develop the basic principles of laboratory alchemy on these classes, and you have, you begin with the herbal class, which is called Prima class. Prima means first, and that's the Latin for first. And then you have three days, non-sequential, um, uh, three days of intensive laboratory class, 12 people, right? And uh, from 9 a.m. to 5 to or 6 p.m. And this is yeah. a very intensive, um, you know, Generally, course. it's two weekends. Mm -hmm. so. Now, tell me, it's three days with, you know, just the theory and then three days with intense laboratory class? Or is that, so it's this a six day? Or is this uh, 
three days where you have, you know, uh, theory and practice in the laboratory? It's, it's actually, we stretch it out to four days to get everything in, and we have demos and lecture. Okay. And we're working, well, we have a classroom and a laboratory, and uh, some things we do outside. We gather herbs here locally and mm -hmm. work on those. And the Prima class is is a bit longer because it really lays the foundation for all the future classes. We have the uh, Secunda class, which is <laughs> sort of an intermediary class yes. between plants and minerals, and then Tertia is is the actual mineral and metal alchemy. Yes. So they're preparatory towards working with the more dangerous materials. Yes, uh, yes. Because yes. there are dangers in, in the metallic alchemy. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Now, on this classes, on this courses, uh, and let me tell you, everybody, uh, we're, we're talking with uh, Robert Allen Bartlett, and he is um, not only a chemistry um, major, he's a chemist, but also he is uh, an alchemist. And the thing is that, you know, on these classes, this these classes are not expensive at all. I mean, you know, at least when you did that video, you just say that, um, you know, it's $75 per person, which is absolutely nothing for a course like this. Now, is it still 75 <laughs> or it's more? I, I don't take care of any of that. My wife handles all the scheduling and mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. and lining up the classes, so it's really thanks to her that these classes even come about. Yeah, yeah. Left to my own devices, I'd probably be stuck in my lab all the time <laughs> playing around. <laughs> <laughs> so this is um, this is um, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about is that alchemy is taught as a neural tradition, which is you know you you see this across many of the traditions, including you know traditional Wicca and you have other you know things that you know even the Raja Christians there are some things that they actually learned and the Masons and all of that. So there's a lot of things that are ta taught by um, an oral tradition. So you can, yes, you can read the books, you can, you know, uh, do the internet and all of that, but you do have to have some things that are only passed through oral tradition. Now, how important is that? Do you think that that's actually the thing that uh, got alchemy until today? I... I like the oral tradition. I think there's something that you pass on. Maybe it's unconscious, but even though I've had students in the class who have read the book, and the books are really, you know, condensations of the classes. And even though they've read the book, it, being in the class environment, seeing the, the demos and the hands-on and the photo tours, it's it just like makes it real and it clicks in the subconscious somehow that it, the information just takes at that point mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and they feel more confident they feel empowered rather than sitting down reading a book yeah, uh, yeah. you know i've read plenty of books i come away not feeling empowered but i've gone to classes and suddenly i feel like yeah i could do this yeah yeah no absolutely absolutely now where are where are they uh when, where are you doing the classes where where is it where is this uh Spergericus we live Institute? in the uh, beautiful pacific northwest yes and uh we live actually on the tulela indian reservation so we're in the a very rural area we have uh, five acres of forested land and we have a classroom laboratory uh, set up there people can camp out if they want if not there's the lodging close by that's convenient um, so but this is this is where you live right yeah yes yeah. this is where you live yes so so it's a very interesting experience not only to have contact with you um, directly but and and learn from you but also you know all of that nature closestness it's just amazing um, now this is in, 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 you we, we have to say this this is in the USA <laughs> because <laughs> some people say, some people are listening to it from from Europe so we have to say that it's in the US and um so you talk about the the metallic basmus which is absolutely something that you know on the on your video it's absolutely amazing i mean you talk about these com compounds that you do um uh and 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 it's just it takes a lot of processes and a lot of time um and 
and it's absolutely amazing. And you say that these actually are, you know, and you 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 have several Bosmas in there, you know, when you present it in the video and you talk about, you yeah. know, you have an iron one, you have a zinc one, you have, you know, the mica, you have the um, iron oxide. oxide. Um, you say that they have regenerative um, properties, um, and it's it's. You said that it's 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 one hundred times more potent and powerful than gallons of tincture um, oh, with yeah. the same properties. So it's it's absolutely amazing how concentrated these things can can be. Now, what I wanted to ask you is that why do you do this? Is it for this particular... Why do you do this? Why do you do alchemy? Why do you go and bother to be in the laboratory so many hours, doing so many, um, you know, um, purifications and, you know, and, and disassembling and assembling again and purifying and, you know, going back... Why are you doing this, Robert? I think at this point it's become a lifestyle. I mean, it's the way I see the world now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I see nothing but alchemy happening in the world. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and uh, it's an important work. The work I'm doing in research is, is reproducing materials and then using chemical instrumentation that's available to me to gather as much information about these things as mm -hmm, I can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, because before anybody's going to take them seriously, uh, medicinally, or otherwise, they're going to want to know what they are. You can't walk in and say, here's the oil of gold, it's good for this and this. Uh, they're going to want to know a little more about it. And so uh, most of the research I do is uh, reproducing materials and trying to gather analytical data using you know current chemical instrumentation. Now, one of the good things is that you, you are actually a chemist. Now, do we need to be chemists? Um, no, to actually practice real not. alchemy. This is one of the questions that people always ask me all the time. No, it's it's handy. If, I mean, for my end, but not at all uh, necessary. In fact, I had to struggle very hard to overcome the chemist mindset in doing alchemical works because uh, they are at odds very often. That's very interesting. So, uh, yeah. you know, getting yourself into the alchemical mindset as opposed to the mindset of the chemist mm -hmm. uh, you, there's a fine line you have to balance mm -hmm. there so mm -hmm. be you know learning chemistry is handy it's useful if you're going to pursue alchemical works but you know modern chemical theory isn't uh, necessary for actually doing the work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now the good thing about these um, and you know you have to help me on this one is that you have small amounts of these you know alchemical uh, compounds that you can take as you know alchemical medicine you know mineral medicine um, compounds that are so powerful that uh, they can actually and this is I think where the myth goes uh, comes from you talk about in your video that it, it will it has regenerative um, uh, properties um, therefore you 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 will grow old S slower, so here is the elixir, elixir of life. I mean, it, it, it's is it kind of like I think a Hollywoodesk, almost like from Hollywood, a Hollywoodesk kind of um, perception that we have of a alchemy. But the principles are there. Yes, you can actually benefit out of this a lot. Um, oh, what yeah. what do you think that it's the biggest um, contribution that alchemy, um, you know, medicine wise, um, health wise, that can bring to people that can actually re real realistically bring to people? Well, I think there's a huge untapped area in medicine because, you know, it. Alchemy has that stigma on it, and people think of alchemy as being turning lead into gold. They have no concept of the medicinal uh, possibilities. Mm -hmm. And you read the alchemist's works, and they say how they use this medicine to cure cancer or leprosy, you know, all sorts of diseases that are dealing with today. And when you go through their texts and you actually make the material according to their directions, it kind of bolsters your... Um, confidence in in their prescribing it for different uh, diseases and conditions. Uh, you know, I've seen 
personally, almost miraculous results on some of these things. Yes. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And they're not clinical trials by any means, but, you know, just personal observations. And, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I've used them on, uh, we have a lot of animals. We've got three horses and three dogs and four cats. <laughs> and they're good patients. I mean, there's no placebo effect. It either works or it doesn't. Yes, you know? yeah, and yeah. I've seen things happen just overnight miraculous cures uh, that's amazing so. that's amazing now why do you think that 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 you know uh people in medicine are not really paying attention to this i think they are coming around you know there's the mindset of the gold thing is kind of dissipating and people <laughs> are starting to look at at the health alternatives especially the rejuvenative effects and and in some ways, the Ayurvedic, the Indian alchemists are ahead of us because they're already doing clinical trials on a lot of the Bosmas and other products from uh, Indian alchemy. Mm -hmm. So they're seriously looking into these things. And uh, on the West, you know, we're still kind of lacking and still looking sidelong at the, the gold-making issue. <laughs> <laughs> I know, the gold-making issue, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, one of the things that really fascinated me was the uh, spagyric anatomy and, you know, how you just take... Um, a, 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 we were ta you were talking in the video, you are talking about, you know, a plant. It was just, a, you know, a, va um, an, er, a plant. And you just take uh, the plant apart, you separate it using only fire. And, and the mastery is in the fire and the controlling of fire. Uh, yeah. You do actually call uh, talk about that in the way of the crucible, one of your books. Um, and and you know it's very important to know how to control the fire to co to capture the various essences from the from this plant, um, and then this whole thing about about the the body the soul and the spirit of this plant, <laughs> which are the you know these the separated this philosophical essentials of this plant. Right, and these these are actually the, you, you tell in the video. It's just an amazing video. I urge you to actually see it. Um, there, there are the the reflections of the spiritual counter or or the spiritual counterparts uh, in the matter on the manifestation, you know, of that plant. It's just an amazing thing. So, um, can you explain to us how you know very generally how you do this project? You know, um, it, it's 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 fascinating. I just wanted to. How do you do this uh, spagyric anatomy kind of separation, and then you put it, it together in their you know essences? Well, most of the processes begin with a fermentation. You know, uh, you're not going to release the spiritual uh, elements of a of a body until it dies. You know, it has to give up the ghost, in a sense. But we're there to capture the ghost and they will rise according to their degree of volatility. And so we can uh, let this material ferment and die and give up the ghost and then slowly pull off um, the more volatile spiritual aspects into a new body. In a sense, they have a new focal point or carrier um, to attach themselves to before they fully dissipate, you know, into the ethers, but these are reflections in matter of very subtle spiritual uh, principles, mm -hmm. you know, from, from the astral or even higher uh, levels of being, they have to have some sort of a, a matrix in, in order to manifest, and, and alchemy is about pulling those apart in such a way that the life force and the consciousness remain intact. So each plant, for example, has a certain character, a certain uh, personality and intelligence, and we seek to uh, keep that intact and move it into a separate vehicle that we can manipulate and purify and then recombine these essential parts of a, a plant uh, in a purified form and sort of resurrect it or in a, reawaken it in a, a new body which is now evolved. So we get back to that process of alchemy is evolution and about evolution. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. these are the processes that provoke that evolution and we're separating them, purifying them separately and then reanimating it in a sense uh, like in a 
Frankensteinian way. I was thinking um, about that just now. <laughs> well, Mary Shelley was fully uh, aware of, of chemical principles. Oh, okay. No doubt about it. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, so this new medicine, they would the ancients would call a glorified corpus or a glorified being, and now it has much more power than, than a common mortal. Mm-hmm. Now, what is the effect if we ingest this... Um, you know, this material analogs of, of you know, or, or the basis of the medicinal alchemy. Uh, what can happen within us? I mean, you as a chemist, you know, are pretty much aware of the, um, of, of the f- physiology, you know, of, of, of the human body and, you know, how it works and how, you know, chemically how it, it goes on. So w- what happens when we ingest that glorified body? Well, there are, depending on how the material is prepared, there are medicinal um, functions, but alchemical medicines tend to work very differently. Um, It's like a melding of a higher spirit with our own spirit, and they work on an astral or mental spiritual level much more powerfully. and they open up subtle channels in the body, uh, the, the whole etheric net of uh, the nadis or channels, the chakra system. Uh, all these are cleared out slowly. That's why we start with the, the herbs, because they're much more gentle and friendly, and they will slowly purge out uh, blockages in all the subtle channels of our body, uh, start to awaken the individual chakras in a very organized way and get all the the internal organs balanced and harmonized and and start purging out all their impurities. So we go through the whole work ourselves, being purified and uh, awakening the centers gradually in the ordered progression instead of just, you know, taking some psychedelic and having your crown chakra open up and you bliss out for a few hours and then you come back to the same old, same old. This is an ordered progression where the chakras are awakened and balanced and they stay awakened and balanced this is amazing because this is it's almost uh, you know comparing to other um you know uh, not compare i don't want to compare anything but i'm just saying that you know comparing to other healing processes um which you know compared to this they are just band-aids really, because they don't really go into the amagus of what is needed to be done and maintained, okay. you know. <laughs> to, I don't know. Am I right? or what Oh, is no, it? absolutely. I mean, look at the state of uh, modern pharmacy. I mean, you, you go on, on TV and there's a commercial for the newest drug of the week, uh, followed by another commercial, <laughs> which is a lawsuit against the last week's drug, you know. <laughs> And the the good thing is the good and bad thing is that when you hear that commercial of the about the drug, you hear all the side effects that can you know occur, yeah. including <laughs> death and blindness yeah. and cancer and. <laughs> why am I taking this drug <laughs> again? But your nose won't be running anymore. <laughs> yes, that that's it. That's <laughs> it. That's fine. But you can have a cancer. It's a <laughs> it's something that you never know. So it's just yes, it's yeah. just amazing, you know. It's just really amazing. Do you think that um, alchemy, being so ancient, will be the future of medicine? I believe it will. I mean, there are amazing untapped areas in alchemy, not just in medicine, uh, but I mean, a whole evolutionary uh, schema of things. But additional things. Uh, Alchemy lies at the root of every esoteric tradition in the West, really, mm-hmm. and most of the arts and sciences, including uh, chemistry and medicine, pharmacy, metallurgy. Uh, the list goes on. Alchemy lies at their very heart and root, and so it can touch all of those areas in, in advanced ways, uh, the whole uh, concept of new types of fuels and energies uh, are well within alchemy's grasp. Now, 
we when we we're going to talk about your books now and and you know I, but before we go there I wanted to ask you we're talking about you know healing which is something that really concerns everyone and and it's something you know that concerns men since and women since uh, you know the dawn of time uh, it's it's health you know and 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 it's something that it's really primer to our necessities and what we are and what we want to be uh, healthy <laughs> but uh, there are other things that alchemy is actually uh, concerned about and it's not only you know this particular part you know people sometimes I wanted to talk about this because I think that this is one of the parts of alchemy that nobody talks about and it's the medical appliance of it um, the the medical application of it now I wanted to talk about um, other things what, what can alchemy bring us other than health well it can bring us enlightenment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, an advanced uh, spiritual perception of the nature of reality why we're here what we're supposed to be doing um, alchemy seeks to answer those questions uh, it's really a, a study of uh, the true nature of reality and our relationship to that truth and uh, the practical application of that knowledge. It's absolutely amazing. Now, um, let's talk about your books. Uh, you have one that we are looking at right now. It's called Real Alchemy, a primer of practical alchemy. Um, and you actually, um, it's, it's just an introduction to alchemy. And it's absolutely an amazing book. Now, I say this a lot to all of my um, guests, you know, on Witch Talk, because I like the books. I really do. And, and one of the things that I really like to do is read. I really like to read. But this is truly... Um, and people, you know, sometimes, you know that thing that, you know, people don't really know what they get in their hands? You know what I mean? It's something so precious that they, oh, they kind of like, oh, yeah, well, real, real alchemy, yeah, well, that's very nice. It's really precious knowledge. And people don't really realize, and sometimes, you know, they don't really see it. Uh, open your eyes, people. This is the real thing. It says real alchemy for, <laughs> for, for a reason. It is real alchemy. And it's one of the most amazing books, along with this one, you know, The Way of the Crucible, that we're going to talk about. Now, uh, why did you intend to write this? Do you think that, you know, are you, are you going away from the oral tradition? Or is there is a lot still in the oral tradition that you're not telling us in this book? No, the... The books were actually a request from students. You know, I, mm -hmm. I never saw myself as a teacher, mm -hmm. uh, but my my wife came home one one day from a, a class. She was getting certified in hypnotherapy, and she mentioned I was interested in alchemy. And everybody goes, "Ooh, ah! I've heard <laughs> of it. I know nothing about it. Could he talk to us about it?" Uh, so we, we scheduled a talk, it was supposed to be a couple of hours, and it ended up being five or six hours long, and everybody was so psyched, they wanted to do another class so we could continue, and and it just started from there, and we started giving classes regularly, and and people asked if we could write a book that they could follow along with, and so I just started taking my class notes, and putting it all together into a book and that's how the book came about. This is an edition of Ebis Press um, and it's uh, Ibis maybe, that's how they say it I think um, and it's, uh, you You can I think you can buy it in Amazon, right? I think you, you can just buy it on Amazon.com and it's absolutely or in their website which is www.ebispress.net and um, ibispress.net and that's um, I-B-I-S press.net um, it's absolutely amazing now let me just um, let me just go through the contents of this book because I think that it's important for people to know what they can get out of it um, 
so this is this is basically uh, do you tell your students to read this beforehand or is this a required um reading it's not required but everyone seems to want to oh yeah one. well i i i know why <laughs> because it's very good so <laughs> you have the, the brief history of alchemy and it's absolutely, you know, I, I do think one of the things that I really like about these books, and, and we can talk about that. We can talk about, you know, the origin of the word of gibberish. And you talk, some, you talk about that in here. Um, one of the things that really people went away or went away from alchemy, it's not really only because they think that this was something, you know, that people did in the Middle Ages and there was like a hoax or, or anything. I think that the, the writings are a little bit hermetic. I mean, there really are obviously hermetic, but they are very um, encoded um, and they're really difficult to understand sometimes. Um, yeah. And we have an author that actually gave the <laughs> the origin of the word gibberish because of that specifically, but you write this book in a f so it's so amazing how clear it is and how wonderful and, and how it's just, you know, it's just you're taking people by the hand and showing them what it is. It's just very, very good. Um, and I'm not saying this because you're <laughs> my show. It really is, and I, I'm really passionate about what I say. I wouldn't say it if I wouldn't be passionate about it, and if I wouldn't really think it, that that was it. Um, one of the I things... Appreciate. Go ahead, go ahead. That's, that's, I appreciate that, and that's largely how the classes go. I, you know, I, I try to empower people to do it themselves because you really have to do the work to make it happen to get the realization. It's a no, absolutely, on. no, absolutely. I, I just, I, I think, I think that first of all, you're very generous, um, and um, you know, you said that I don't want to be a teacher, but I think that you, you know, you're meant to be. You know, there's no other. <laughs> you have to, because <laughs> this is this is something that you have to do in order to alchemy to actually continue and 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 grow in other people. Um, so you talk about the brief history of alchemy on this book, Real Alchemy. Um, you talk about the theory uh, of alchemy, the astrology and alchemy. So you, you give an introduction to everything, including the laboratory um, of alchemy, uh, alchemical processes, herbal alchemy, all of this, uh, water work, you know, all of the Kabbalah and alch It's almost an introduction theory course on what is alchemy and the relation of alchemy to other disciplines like Kabbalah or astrology and all of that. Yeah, um, go ahead, go ahead. They all grew up together. Absolutely, no, absolutely. And what is, this is something that it's on, you know, this is, we're not in Harry Potter, people. We're really talking with <laughs> an alchemist. <laughs> <laughs> but there is something in the Harry Potter movies that they call, you know, actually, they, they, they actually talked about it. Um, and they named uh, a, a movie out of it, The Philosopher's Stone. Now, yeah. what is The Philosopher's Stone? The Philosopher's Stone is... <laughs> Seriously? It's the divine made manifest. Because we're working with principles that reach all the way up into, you know, the divine realms. Mm -hmm. And we're working with their material analogs and purifying them, putting them together in such a way that a new being manifests. and. The Philosopher's Stone is like the ultimate pinnacle of that and bringing down a spiritual being into uh, into matter. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the whole genie in the bottle thing takes on new connotations. Uh, beings within matter in, in a form. And the Philosopher's Stone is such that it can instantly perfect other things, evolve so if you were to take it medicinally, you could become cured of anything and uh, become spiritually awakened. If you were to treat a metal with it, then that corrosivity of the metal would be healed, and the metal would be evolved into its summit of being the metal gold. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Now, is there any metaphor on all of this? I mean, because people sometimes say, oh, yeah, well, the philosopher's stone, it's kind of like a metaphor or the attaining of gold or transformation. Yeah, yeah, well, the yeah, chemical transformation is actually something spiritual more than anything else. You know, forget the lapse. <laughs> How much misperceptions did you came across, and 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 how did you clarify this? Because this is, you know, we need to tell people that uh, no, you you can't do the philosopher's stone. Oh, yes, you can, or yes, you can produce gold. Um, and and what is what is metaphor and what is not? Uh, I think it's uh, it's more. Um it's universal. I mean, the the archetypes that we're talking about, uh, you know, in spiritual or mental or astral, however you want to divide, you know, levels of reality, um, there's the physical component as well. And the same principles are at large in all of the kingdoms. And so alchemy really is a way of demonstrating nature's laws as being verifiable. So something that maybe you think of as a spiritual metaphor, uh, it has a physical counterpart that can be proven. And if that metaphor on a mental or spiritual level is true, then uh, its reflection in matter should also prove out, and you should be able to demonstrate the same principles at work on any level. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now I want to I want to show people because sometimes people I mean it's it's amazing I love the artwork of the covers of your books oh, yeah. um, Real Alchemy and and let me just show people um, the amazing work of this uh, absolutely amazing author um, artist uh, that it's uh, B A Verling um, and he has this fantastic uh, paintings. Um, and and he was the artist. I mean, did you know? Do you know? Obviously, you know him, or um, you know, I don't. Is it a him? Is it's a him, right? Yes, uh, Benjamin. Yes, Benjamin. Because <laughs> it's B A. We don't know what B A. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of yeah. yeah. I can't be a girl. Can't be but a man. amazing <laughs> artist. I just uh, I told him you know I wanted a, a phoenix on the second book and gave him kind of a ballpark idea of what I wanted, and he sent back a. A sketch within a week or so, and it was perfect. Absolutely, Absolutely amazing. Perfect. Absolutely amazing. Change anything. <laughs> now, let me tell you that uh, this this particular art form that I have uh, on on the computer right now, I mean on the video show, um, it's absolutely amazing. It's 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 all this table full of very intricate, you know, things. I do have this incensary that he has here, and I'm sure that he has the same <laughs> as me because this had to be a model somewhere. Um, and I do have this. It's absolutely amazing. Um, I mean, I just love this. This um, the whole thing. It's brilliant, brilliant, very, well, very yeah. talented. And this is all all oil and egg tempera um, on panel. It's absolutely yeah. amazing. Did you know him? Yeah. Did you meet him? Obviously, you know. But uh, tell us the I, story. I met him through uh, some friends who were um, publishing the first book when the when the first book, Real Alchemy, came out. Uh, we had some. Uh, people who were helping us to develop that, and they had experience in in publishing. So I pretty much put it in their hands, gave them the manuscript, and they sought out. Uh, they knew this artist and uh, commissioned him to to do the painting on real alchemy. Um, that first allegiance kind of fell apart, and we ended up self-publishing on. Uh, uh, one of the self-publishing sites, mm -hmm. Lulu, mm -hmm. and uh, we got a hold of Ben and asked if we could get rights for the uh, the painting, which he graciously uh, gave to us, and we commissioned him right there to uh, draw the uh, the next cover, which was the the Phoenix on the Way of the Crucible. So uh, we've been in contact with him uh, a number of times, and. Uh, well, he's certainly connected. He's certainly connected with uh, with the occult because some of his uh, paintings have um, very clear imagery that relates to the occult. Um, yeah, and it's absolutely amazing. I think that he should be hired, you know, for everyone's covers because he's absolutely amazing. 
his I would love to commission him to make a, a alchemical tarot deck. Oh yes. Oh yes. That <laughs> we would love that. Yeah. yeah. yeah I would. Uh, I would direct him. I have ideas on a, a deck that would be really wild. Oh yeah. No, I. I we right. will wait for has, that. Yeah. <laughs> he has his finger on the pulse of occult symbolism, so I. I really like. Him. Oh yeah, like yeah, it. yeah. He's absolutely amazing. Look at this. This we're looking at some some um absolutely amazing. Uh, it's called Visum et Reperium. Um, and it's acrylic on panel. It's absolutely amazing. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. I think it's death, but um, it's depiction of death. It's just amazing how wonderful this art is. And, you know, I just would love to have him on the show also. Uh, I can see why you see um, him doing a tarot deck. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, his website is w www.bverling.com bverling.com and it's absolutely amazing just just delight yourself just to see it um, if you're not buying anything although I do <laughs> have to say that if I can if I could I would just buy, buy everything that he has because it's just amazing it's it's amazing it's really good I mean it's really really good and and you know I just love the covers of your books now now let's talk about um, let me see if there is any um, other um, questions for you on the chat room I don't think there are let me see here um, Oh uh, yes, let let's 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 talk about well well. There's a lot of things that I wanted to talk about. One of them is the alchemic st uh, alchemy study. Uh, there is this program, um, and you are one of the one of the teachers on this program, um, and it's it's absolutely amazing. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? It's called alchem alchemy study alchemy study alchemy study yeah, program. Uh, the, yeah. Well, the website is. Uh www.alchemystudy.org hmm. and they have me <clears throat> they have me listed as instructor A yes um, there are a number of uh, instructors this is part of the alchemy guild yes so uh, they're the ones who uh, organize the annual alchemy conference yes uh, there's Conference coming up in LA this year. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so uh, this is part of their work, uh, you know, getting alchemy out there on on all the different levels. Some people aren't interested in laboratory alchemy; they want the spiritual aspects uh, only, uh, which is okay, and they can, uh, you know, teach in that yeah. area. Yeah. My expertise is in the laboratory tradition, and so I. I teach in that, and I uh, provide some course materials uh, in that area, and and so it's an online study over time, and you can you know contact me directly if you have questions. And that's wonderful. Yeah. That's very good. So it says, Alchemy study. Learn the ancient art of transformation. The secrets of alchemy taught by practicing alchemists, which is absolutely true. Now uh, let's talk about your latest book um, the way of the crucible right this is the last yeah. one um, and this is a more in-depth um, study of of alchemy I mean it's really something that you go in depth into things like um, I mean you talk about water but it you know what is the the importance of water um, manipulating the cheese slash premise slash mercury it's just something that it's absolutely amazing how you know people people have to understand that when you talk about these things you don't talk about just oh I'm talking about energy no it's not really that you go and you touch in various you know uh, cultures perceptions of each of the things so we're talking about chi you know and we're talking about prana and we're talking about mercury so it's it's all of this and how do you uh, manipulate this and how do you uh, go around with this it's just amazing 
the koshas, the chakras, the energy bodies, it's another thing. It's another example on how you just touch all of these, you know. And it's it, it seems to me that you just want to uh, explain to people that these things actually happened in a lot of cultures, um, but they are actually the same thing and they have different names but they're you know they can't actually be manipulated and worked um, in the same way do you agree with this yeah they are uh, you know we're reflections of universal truth mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, perceived mm -hmm. by different cultures through time and uh, it's really just a mishmash of words that keeps the things apart and so if we can clarify concepts, they call it prana over here, or chi, we call it mercury over here. If we can get clear on the terms, then all these things start to coalesce and mm -hmm. become a universal map. Did you ever thought that you were going to, first of all, continue Founders Alberta's uh, work when you first walked into that lab? Uh. <laughs> Tough question. Uh, <laughs> I can't say. Uh, it's something I always wanted to pursue, and I couldn't see not pursuing it because, you know, it just touches all the areas of magical, occult uh, interests that I have, mm -hmm, naturally. Mm -hmm. so, uh, this just ties everything together yeah, uh, yeah. on so many different levels. Yeah. and. Like I said earlier, now it's just become my lifestyle. <laughs> it's how I perceive the world, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, absolutely. Now, I love the, the chapter 12 on this book because, you know, I know that uh, um, it's very important to know the secrets of fire. And that's what the 12th <laughs> chapter is about. Um, you know, and how important it is to understand fire in, in alchemy? Fire is the key to the whole thing. It's all about the fire. And there are many different forms of fire. You know, we carry our own fire inside of us. And, I mean, our whole life is, is about feeding and keeping the fire going, the fire of life. Um, and in alchemy, you run into all different types and forms and guises of fire, from, you know, the sun blazing in the sky to... Uh, you know, the fire that's keeping you alive to the fire that's cooking your food in the kitchen. Uh, it's all about that energy. Mm -hmm. And and it's very interesting. If, if we know a little bit of, uh, you know, uh, energy work and chemistry, we know that um, heat is... Um, produced by the vibration of molecules and you know it's it's very interesting you know because that's you know what fire does it's actually you know um, intensifying that vibration um, now uh, tell me about the book of uh, antimony antimony is uh, a special material you know uh, most of the metals and minerals have a single planet that they call their ruler. So, for example, copper or metal is ruled by Venus, or iron is ruled by Mars. Uh, antimony is unique, being a planet unique to the Earth plane, and it is uh, it encompasses all the seven planets, uh, seven ancient traditional planets. Mm -hmm. And so, depending on how it is prepared, it can manifest any of those planetary type of energies, uh, archetypal forces. But uh, antimony has amazing healing potentials that um, are unrecognized today. Of I mean, course. I've seen, antimony, <laughs> I've seen antimony kick out things just overnight, which would seem impossible. Um, it's just an amazing material. and full of surprises. The The more you work on antimony, the more interesting it is because there are just uh, almost an infinite number of ways of processing it and preparing it to obtain entirely different uh, effects and results in the same material. What does antimony mean? I mean, where does the word come from? Antimony is the sulfide mineral of... Um, well, antimony is a, one of the 
materials on the periodic table, but it comes from a mineral called stibnite, mm -hmm. which is sulfide of antimony. Antimony is used in amazing variety of things, from matches to uh, computer uh, materials. Like uh, they use it to dope silicon wafers. To it's a semiconductor, basically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of electronic applications, um, it's used as a fire retardant in paints, it's used in batteries and fuel cells. Uh, and how uh, how can we use it in, in, in the health um, processes? How how can you, we use that antimony? What, what does well, it do? Uh, on its own, it's a toxic, I mean, it's a violent poison. It's mm. right next to uh, arsenic, <laughs> really, in the property. So, I mean, that's why we teach the plant... Uh, first, <laughs> alchemy first, because <laughs> you don't want to go mess around with antimony yeah, because uh, yeah, yeah. you might end up dead. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But antimony can be prepared in in a number of ways. I mean, the most common way is um, fusing it into a glass and extracting the glass with a, a special solvent and uh, distilling the residue. It's it's a whole long process. Mm -hmm. It's detailed in the book and. There are a number of ways of preparing different types of oils and uh, substances from antimony which are useful in medicine. Um, you have salts several, and, and oils and, you know, all of that. Several ancient authors have, have claimed uh, curing cancer. With um, antimony. Yeah. With antimony oils, yes. yeah. yeah. And, and that's separated by many countries and times, uh, but they all have the same experience. All of this in his book... Um, the Way of the Crucible. Now, I want to know where this... Uh, I want you to explain to us where this uh, title comes from of your book, The Way of the Crucible. This was... <laughs> there's a, an author, uh, his name was Iranius Philalyses. Mm -hmm. uh, Philalyses means the lover of truth. Uh, he was actually an American uh, alchemist. And he mentions alchemy, and he's talking about uh, the origins of alchemy, and he says, you know, why do I care if it was known by this or that ancient personage? It's, you know, sufficient for me to know that it works right now here, and even though people, you know, separated through time and, and the language, uh, they're all talking about the same thing and that it works. And he called it the way of the crucible because... Uh, the crucible is uh, an important alchemical uh, feature in, in symbolism and, and in the work. So you do a lot of work that takes place inside of a crucible, very hot temperatures, yeah, yeah. especially with the uh, metallic works. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, I derived the name from what he called it, the way of the crucible. I thought it was pretty cool. It's very interesting. Yeah. It's absolutely amazing. And it's just, the, the cover, as I said, I mean, it's just... Absolutely amazing, and um, so what? Why? What would you say about you know the differences between the first book, which is the the uh, uh, the real alchemy, a primer of practical alchemy, and the second book? What What is the lip here? Um, is it a more in depth? Uh, why did you wrote the way of the crucible? It was an extension of the first book. Mm -hmm. The first book, you know, laid down the basic principles and ideas and then the <clears throat> the second book the way the crucible elaborated a little bit more on those ideas uh, gave a little bit more information and and then looked more deeply into some of the mineral and metallic preparations which are very hard to find i mean there are a couple of books out there that are very good on herbal alchemy and you can find a number of websites that explain herbal alchemy but very little on a practical approach to the mineral and metallic realms that are, you know, easily available and, and understandable, you know, in, in a non-gibberish kind of way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to make uh, that information available, but, you know, with due precaution. Of course, of course. Now, um, uh, this is a, I mean, it's not a small book. Uh, the Way of the Crucible that we're looking at right now, um, you know, and you're going to see it. I, I don't know. Are you, uh, you're not looking at the computer, are you, Robert? No. 
No. No. Yeah, but you're going to see it afterwards. Uh, we're showing the cover next to your uh, picture. Uh, but it's it's just a, an amazing book. It's not small. I mean, it's not really as small as the Real Alchemy book, the primer of the Practical Alchemy. Uh, but it's a more in-depth. I mean, you, you have descriptions of pr of procedures, right? And and how you you do things and all that. Oh, yeah. It always, always, um, uh, it, it's always strange for someone that doesn't really, you know, it doesn't dwell in al in chemistry at all, um, that you want to really know a little bit more. So how how can we? I mean, there's there's this laboratory, very practical, very you know, you know, you, you hands on alchemy, and there is the other part of alchemy. So h how many parts in alchemy can you just you know? The, see that people can actually dedicate themselves to? Well, the, the laboratory tradition is is really a key, and you, know, <laughs> you have to do the work. Yeah. And there are simple ways to do that, and that's why in the classes and in the books I try to present methods that aren't, you know, overly technical, that people, people can get a hold of jars and, you know, coffee filters and simple things like that. And mm -hmm. You know, you think you have to have this huge laboratory at your disposal to do alchemy, but that's not true at all. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can do it with very simple things, and I try to show people alternatives to all this expensive stuff because, you know, I've blown up my share of expensive stuff, and, and I've had to find cheap alternatives. Yeah, and yeah. it really empowers people to see that they could actually do this stuff. And... And once you start playing around with these things, then the principles and, and all the things you've read in these obscure texts start to click and make sense. Mm -hmm. and, and you suddenly understand what they were talking about. You go back and you read again and you get a little bit more and then you play a little more with the the principles and it, it just self-builds and until over time it becomes uh, really clear how things are operating and how things really are connected and the alchemical principles are really present everywhere if you just look for them. And now that you've experienced them, you see them much more clearly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking with Robert Alan Bartlett, the author of Real Alchemy, A Primer of Practical Alchemy, and also the author of The Way of the Crucible, another book that goes into uh, a little bit more in depth uh, on the alchemy practices. Now, he's a um, chemist, uh, chemist also, um, and, and you, tell, you told us, you know, that, you know, it's good to have a knowledge of uh, <laughs> chemistry on, along with it. There is a question with the chat room on the chat room um, by Master Nestor also why do you think that that so many has such a dislike for the puffers as they call the lab alchemists I, I didn't get the last part. Uh, why? Why, do, why do you think that there are so many um, th there, there, there are so many has dislike for the puffers as they call the lab alchemists well the puffers were, it's kind of a term from the Middle Ages again, yes. when there were so many people out there <coughs> trying to make gold, <laughs> and they would sit there for hours at their furnaces and the little uh, blowers puffing it, you know, trying to get it hotter and hotter. They figured if they get it hot enough, they can cause a transmutation. And, you know, it was thanks to the puffers that there are a lot of chemical discoveries out there. They made a lot of advancements in in chemistry, uh, even though they were possibly uh, unsuccessful in the alchemical work. But I think uh, a lot of the distrust is, is through misinformation or misguided information. They're looking at uh, the alchemical work as a, a means to get rich and, and how to transmute metals is their main goal and objective and anything else is you know, no interest. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. you know, from the spiritual aspect of alchemy, you know, people have gotten a, a bad view of puffers as just being materialists. They're not really looking at the real alchemy. They're looking at a means to get rich quick, you know. And yeah. if they can't do it themselves, then they'll, you know, try and con somebody into getting their money so they can continue their research and uh, 
milk them dry and then disappear in the night somewhere. So, <laughs> alchemy, you know, yeah. They give alchemy a bad name, and, yeah. and still that's part of the reason the, uh, the whole stigma of alchemy has stuck for so long is that there are people who will do that. Now, but, now let's dismystify this. Um, for so many centuries and, 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 you know, for so long, people thought that, you know, let, let's dismystify this gold digger transmutation of lesser metals into gold thing that it's hanging on <laughs> every alchemist's head um of the less you know of the of the of the lay people you know uh they're not alchemists um let's just dismystify this tell me is it possible to transmute <coughs> any lesser metal or as you said evolve that metal into a pure state that being gold um, and if it is how many golds do we have because I know that there is more than one uh, yes it is possible um, you know it, up until uh, about the turn of the 1900s uh, it was pretty much a given all through the 1800s that the elements were immutable, and you couldn't change one from the other, and the alchemists were crazy people. Um, and then later, around, you know, 1900s, they discovered radioactivity, and suddenly elements were changing. They were seeing it happen. It's a natural process that elements do transmute, and so right there, put a big hole in that theory. <laughs> And now, you know, they're still in a big controversy about cold fusion. This is low low temperature nuclear reactions are a possibility. And also with the uh, biological transmutations, you know, they would feed animals a certain feed that is missing an element and the element would show up in in you know the the animal in a normal amount and it wasn't scavenged from any part of the animal. It was something in their food was transmuted into the element they needed. And mm -hmm. the classic the classic experiment is the chicken. You know, they uh, they fed chickens a diet that had no calcium whatsoever, uh, but they had mica to peck on, which is high in silica. Mm -hmm. And they found out that after a time, the chickens laid so many eggs with calcium shells that it would have taken the entire chicken's uh, skeleton to produce that if the chicken had to use its own bones uh, as a source of yeah. calcium, yeah. but it had no calcium, and so where did the calcium come from? Somehow it transmuted something it was eating, they suspect the silica in the mica, and was being transmuted into calcium. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And there are a number of biological experiments that show that. In fact, the U.S. military was interested in the whole field of biological transmutations as a possible uh, energy source, uh, and they proposed uh, mechanisms as to how this was happening inside uh, living tissues that elements were indeed being transmuted into other elements. And so, you know, the whole concept of metals being transmuted doesn't sound quite so far-fetched. And uh, the most recent example I can think of uh, is one in India. Uh, this was in the 40s. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a demonstration of an Indian alchemist uh, actually transmuting mercury, metallic mercury, into gold, uh, you know, in front of about 30 uh, respected uh, business people, uh, engineers, scientists, uh, state dignitaries, <laughs> uh, right there in front of them, transmuted the uh, nearly a, a pound or two of mercury into gold. That's and, amazing. Uh, That's amazing. That's amazing. And it's recorded on uh, on one of the temples right there in uh, New Delhi. That's fantastic. So yeah. the possibilities are there, and Chinese and Indian alchemy talk about the possibility of transmutation of gold or mercury into gold, but as a test for the, the actual philosopher's stone, once you have it, this is the final test to show that it's ready, and that it would be useful for uh, causing spiritual uh, enlightenment. Um, it was never the main goal, which it became in the West. You know, in the West, that's all they had to hear about is this stuff makes gold, and so everybody was trying to to make gold instead of you know its actual purpose as a medicine. Uh, 
yeah. not just for the body but for the soul as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Now, now tell me, tell me one uh, one of the things that I wanted to know about this is that um, what what do you expect alchemy becomes in the future? Because this is something that I think that you worked on uh, through your classes, through uh, your books. What do you want to, alchemy to become in the future? I think, well, alchemy is becoming quickly a, a legitimate area of study, mm -hmm. starting to shake off that whole uh, stigma of being the gold-making thing uh, into something that's much more. And, and I think it can become really a unifying principle in many areas, not just uh, medicine, but philosophy and religion, uh, so many areas that it touches and unifies because it's it teaches a universal language. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all the religions talk about alchemy in their own forms. Uh, they just use different words, just like the, uh, the different authors in alchemy. They seem to be talking about different things, but in the end, they're all talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. And these are universal principles that are across the board. And I think uh, alchemy can have that influence of mm -hmm. unifying a lot of different areas that are um, at odds with each other or seem to be uh, totally different areas of interest. Uh, alchemy can bring all these things together and really unify things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, that's, that's fantastic. I just love it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking with Robert Allen Bartlett, and he is the author of Real Alchemy, a Primer of Practical Alchemy, and which is an introduction to um, the practice of alchemy, and also The Way of the Crucible, which is uh, the second book uh, that he um, put out, and it's a deeper, um, you know, approach to what he wrote in the first one, into the ways of alchemy. So this is two books that I think um, you know everyone that even not interested in you know in in alchemy in the very deepest sense and just wanted to know what it is I think that you should buy both of them because it's absolutely amazing the way that Robert actually writes about it it's very clear very accessible you can actually learn a lot about it um, and you can learn about not only alchemy but other things also so it's 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 everything in there um, you can t you can learn about energy you can learn about fire it's just the whole thing and it's absolutely amazing um, you know both of the books are um, absolutely amazing where can we buy these books can, can you tell us uh, Robert do you know that uh, well through I use press mm -hmm. uh, also available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. So we can get it anywhere, basically. <laughs> yeah, hopefully everywhere. So uh, just I just wanted to really um, uh, we have we have a last question for the chat room, which is um, from Master Nestor also, um, and and he he asks, uh, isn't the phoenix bird an alcohol? Alch alchemist alch alchemistic process that goes destroyed by the fire and reward by the ashes. Hello, Robert? Hello, I'm Hi. not sure I understand the question. Okay. <laughs> Isn't the phoenix rebirth uh, an yeah. alch alchemical process, meaning that it gets destroyed by the fire and reborn by the a in the ashes? Yes. So you you do agree? I do agree. Yes, <laughs> for the uh, alchemical method is a uh, is a calcination, a burning off of what's impure to reveal what's true yes. and pure and incorruptible, yes. and uh, and then to reawaken and re-enliven that into a, a new state, a new order of being. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the phoenix is this perfect. Uh, example of alchemical symbolism uh, you know uh, it regenerates itself and, and burns itself to ash to get rid of all which is impure and corruptible to reveal what's 
pure and lasting and eternal and you can withstand the full on flame and and not be harmed because it is incorruptible. It's beyond all of that. Robert, thank you so much for <laughs> this uh, amazing show uh, with you and, and all of this knowledge. I mean, it's just, you know, I have to tell again, Real Alchemy, A Primer of Practical Alchemy by Robert Allen Bartley and, and also The Way of the Crucible, two books that I think that everyone should have, uh, even if they're not <laughs> interested in alchemy, just to see what alchemy is or to have the knowledge um, that alchemy is actually not just <laughs> to transmute um, from lesser metals to gold. Um, it's much, much more. Uh, I think that you should buy these books, the two of them, to have that reality, uh, that reality check <laughs> on what real alchemy is. Thank you so much, Robert, for being oh, here. Thank you for having me on your show. And I, I had a very good time. Oh, thank you so much. And and don't go anywhere. Don't hang up because I'm going to just close the show and I will talk to you when we have the show uh, off. Okay. Don't go okay. anywhere. Just don't get. Don't 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 go anywhere. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm th here. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here <laughs> on Witch Talk. And um, thank you for so much for the for the answers. Thank you, um, Indigo Estrella. Thank you, Master Nestor, and all of the people on the chat room. Um, thank you so much for being here and uh, for listening to Witch Talk and for seeing Witch Talk. Uh, I will see you next week um, with another guest, another book, and another fantastic show of which talk. Until then, have a wonderful, wonderful week. Bye-bye.